All right, um, this is my first attempt to create any sort of Cinema 4D texture. Um, and specifically, I set out to see what we could do to leverage Grobato's automatically generated UV maps and uh, its mesh structure to create and manipulate textures in Cinema 4D. So here we are in the body paint UV edit mode of Cinema 4D. And I like to tear off this UV Tools menu, submenu from the Tools menu. Uh, that will come in handy later. And uh, this is a, the body of the Colonel Parrish model that some of you will recognize from the contest currently running on uh, Cinema 4D Cafe forums. And that model was set up for painting using the 3D Paint Wizard. We've got it set up for 3D Paint with projection off at the moment. And I've got a working layered single texture here, and we're going to deconstruct that layered paint texture. The top layer is this layer that I've named Edge Burn, which provides this soft gradient burn that you see around uh, all of the edges of the various patches of the model. So let's hide that layer and see what we have underneath. Here we have the UV mesh layer, which is something you can uh, body paint will generate for you automatically. Here I've uh, changed, all I've done is change its color to blue so it shows up uh, more clearly against this light background I have. And it's just a reference layer. We use it to help select various portions of the model and you'll see that in action as we go along. There's the item that you use to create this UV mesh layer. All right, so we'll hide that. This is a simple layer, this edge tint layer. If you watch the model, you'll see that as I turn it on and off, the edges, the uh, seams around these patches that form the model turn lighter and darker. And I took advantage of the fact that those seams tend to be located towards the top of Grobato's automatically generated UV map. That's not a strict rule. You'll have to do a little bit of um, more careful editing with some models. But here it uh, works pretty uh, thoroughly to select just those edge or loop polygons. This layer is a pattern layer just to give the um, undercoating, if you will, of this texture a little bit of interest and variety. It, curiously enough, it was created with Grobato's texturing system, which creates not only seamless but uh, patternless textures. They're not actually rectangular tiled uh, seamless bitmaps. It's another technique that we'll get into at some other time. Anyway, I set that to a low opacity. And underneath that, I have a background layer, which is simply white at this point. Uh, very likely, as I move along, I will eventually change that color, and it will tend to tint everything above it, because all of these other layers are either only partly opaque or use some sort of blending mode. Uh, for example, we use Multiply with this Edge Burn layer, because that's what I want it to do. I don't want it to obscure the underlying layers. I want it to simply tint them, providing that soft gradient burnt edge. And uh, let's take a look at how that was created. So to do that I'm going to select delete from the edit menu and in this context it doesn't actually delete the layer when you use it from the edit menu there it deletes the contents of the layer. So you see the layer is still there it's simply empty now. And I'm going to recreate that layer. And to do that we take advantage again of this UV mesh layer which is simply the UV polygons that were automatically created by Grobato. I'm going to use the magic wand tool and I'm going to click anywhere outside of those patches that you see. And uh, small problem here, I need to uh, have this uh, hide selection on. I need to turn that off so we can see the selection. And there it is, but that selection was made by just one click anywhere outside of those polygons. Now there are some inclusions, some holes in these polygon uh, patches, if you will, and we need to catch those as well by using shift click which adds to our current selection. And fortunately I've been here before, I did run through this a couple of times and I know where those uh, holes are in some of these meshes and I can just quickly go around and, and uh, add them to the selection and fortunately there aren't very many of them. I'll zoom in a little bit here and catch these on his chest plate, those three holes right there. So what we're doing is we're setting up a selection that we will use to uh, create that soft gradient burnt edge. So you can see we now have a selection that surrounds all of these polygon patches. 
So again, we have selected everything outside of those polygon patches, and that's close to what we want, but it's not exactly what we want because we want the selection to invade those patches a bit. And that's easy enough to do with the uh, grow selection option. I'm going to grow it by a radius of about six pixels. And you'll see as it expands, it actually invades those polygonal patches, which is just what we want. So now we're ready to fill that selection. And it doesn't matter that we're going to be filling up this entire bitmap, except for those patches, with uh, this dark red color that I've selected here. Um, because none of that area, except where it crosses over into the polygonal patches, will actually show up in the texture. So I've hidden the selection here. That way we'll be able to see things more clearly. Back to the edge burn layer before we fill, because that's the layer that we want to fill. And just select fill layer from the edit menu. And there you see it, and you can see it in the rendering in the workspace. It's a very crude fill, a very crude selection, because it's a ragged edged um, aliased selection. But that doesn't matter because we're going to be blurring it rather significantly. So in order to do that, we need to deselect everything, because now when we blur, we want the blur to be able to go wherever it wants to go. We don't want to confine it to that selection. So I go over here to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. And you can see I played with it before, so it's already set to something fairly high, 30 pixel radius of 30. And you can play with that, and you can see you can blur it uh, quite uh, severely and get this very nice, almost imperceptible, soft burn. And I will note that the seams are remaining dark there because of that edge tint layer that we looked at earlier. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, it's a separate thing. But the blur itself, you can see, it can be very narrow or quite wide. And uh, that all depends on what you want to do with it. it this kind of uh, selection, this kind of blur can be used for all kinds of things, including edge wear and damage and uh, aging and that sort of thing. But uh, something about like this uh, works for me, for what I want to get out of this, which is just kind of a subtle uh, darkening and burning around the edges. Now, one thing that, that you'll notice is that it's, it's kind of weak in the sense that uh, that blurring causes it to be thin as far as its opacity um, everywhere. It gets blurred everywhere and it gets kind of uh, translucent everywhere. That becomes more apparent if we toggle this edge tint layer on and off or play with its opacity. And, and by the way, that's something that you'll, you'll want to do if you are using this edge tint together with this uh, kind of patch surrounding blur. So, uh, for what I'm trying to achieve, it, it seems a little thin to me, a little too translucent, but there's a neat trick you can use to strengthen that. And we do that by um, using this Selection from Layer option in the Select menu. With the Edge Burn layer selected, and you see that gives us the uh, opaque parts of that Edge Burn layer. Now, if we hide that selection so we can see things more clearly, and then Fill again, it's filling, but it's filling based on the transparency of the layer. So really what it does is just kind of multiply or amplify the existing uh, edge burn. So now I've got something quite strong and I have more room to work. I can play with the opacity and get the kind of overall darkening that I want. But you can see it's, it's much stronger, especially as it approaches the edge and tends to match up with the darkness of the tinted seams or edge loops. So, in any, case, in any case, that's that's all fine, but it has a kind of uh, uniform analytic uh, flavor to it because that's the way it was created. And uh, I like to mix it up a little bit, vary the amount of burn around the edges to make it a little more natural. And one way to do that, curiously enough, is to use the um, sponge tool, the which you can use to saturate or desaturate uh, the colors. So we deselect everything because we want this to work freely on everything in this edge burn layer. And now I can go around and scrub. Whoops, uh, problem there. We it's, it's set to desaturate. I want it set to saturate. Now it may seem odd to use saturate for something like this where you think, well, wouldn't you want to burn? The problem with burn is that it desaturates. So the typical approach, and that's why the sponge is grouped with the burn and dodge tools, is to burn and then saturate. 
But in this particular case, it works fine just to go straight to saturate. And you can see it's expanding that burn. But it won't go too far because it's only working with the parts of that layer which already exist and already have some opacity. Now I could use a smaller brush and get a little bit more granular, a little bit more uh, a finer, smaller size variance, variation to that uh, edge. But uh, that round brush is kind of uninteresting and doesn't really meld well with the feeling of the texture. So instead, um, I'm going to undo all that that I did with that small brush and switch over to a brush I created. And this brush is just a kind of faceted pattern. And I just, uh, what I did was I used the, uh, one of the existing brushes from Cinema 4D and just replaced it with my bitmap. And it's one of these brushes that has um, scattering uh, and jitter set turned on. You can see that down here uh, with settings that I don't know much about, but uh, like I said, I just inherited them from an existing uh, body paint brush. And uh, I'm going to go back and um, reactivate that selection. You can see it there. Because now that we're painting, we don't want this brush to start going everywhere. We want to uh, just accentuate the already opaque parts of the uh, burn, edge burn layer. So we're finally set to go here. And I'm going to uh, increase the size of the brush a little bit here and just start kind of scribbling around. And you'll see that it has a different flavor. Um, see it maybe a little bit better up here. The, the pattern of the brush, make it a little stronger here so we can see it, has that kind of faceted quality that seems to fit well with that underlying texture that I have there. So we can go around and again make this burning less uniform and at the same time give it some nice character that matches the overall feeling of the texture. And you can do as much of this or as little as you want. You can go back and forth. You can erase parts of this if you don't like it. You can make the burn overall thinner by erasing uh, the burn layer. And I'm not trying to do anything too much here. There's not much aesthetics in this texture that I'm creating since I'm just sort of poking around to see how things work myself. Um, you can do things like change the color, which certainly adds variety. And uh, by the way, reveals that uh, faceted nature of that brush I'm using a little better. However, there's a, a bit of an unwanted effect here. You'll notice that as I paint, that the paint goes anywhere where that edge burn layer is opaque, like right over these buttons. And I might want to uh, exclude them from this painting. So now we're going to get into a different kind of selection that will help us paint uh, more discreetly into patches or other selected parts of the Gorbato mesh. And that's where these UV tools come in handy. Specifically, I'm going to be using the rectangle selection. And because of the way the UV map is uh, set up with uh, the Gorbato generated UVs, it's very easy to select, say, a patch like this chest plate here with the rectangle selection tool. And that's a nice, very discreet selection, you know, right along the edges of the patch. But it's not exactly the selection I want. That, that is sort of the face of the patch, if you will, the face of that chest plate. And even though we can use this to create a selection in the bitmap, it's not including parts of it that I would like to include, which are the edge loops, parts of the edge loops that surround this patch. I want it to extend a little bit further. And there's not an easy way to do that with UV-based, bitmap-based selections, uh, polygons or otherwise, because those UV polygons are not contiguous in this UV map. Some of them are up here in the edge loop section of the UV map. But fortunately, we can use geometry-based selection tools because those polygons are contiguous in the geometry. So I'm going to deselect everything here. And um, we're going to look at that selection that we had and see how it's different from the geometric selection. I'm going to go over here to uh, Objects. And there's a selection set that I defined earlier. And there's another video that shows how you can use loops and patches to make good selections of the Gorbato model, and I'm not going to uh, get into that here. Instead, we're just going to use, again, a selection set that I created with those geometric polygon selection tools. And I'm going to select those polygons with the Select Polygons button. And you'll notice the difference. The edge loop polygons that are the edge that connects to the face plate, if you will, of that uh, chest plate are now included. And if we switch back to 3D Paint, 
and look at UV polygons, activate them by clicking on the UV polygons item here, there you will see that those geometric polygons are now the UV polygons. And all we have to do is go down here to the Select menu and Create Mask from Selection. And now you have it. A selection that includes not only the face of the chest plate, but also the edge loops that surround it. So I'll go ahead and uh, hide that selection so we can see our painting more clearly and, and create a new layer uh, and paint into that. Uh, get away from this edge burn stuff and just be able to paint freely. So I'm going back to my faceted brush and picking a different color. And sure enough, when I start painting, you'll notice that everything other than those specific polygons that we selected uh, is protected. And we can move the brush freely and not worry about painting things that we don't want to paint. So that's, that's all great, but you can run into problems with this sort of thing when using 3D paint without projection. And without projection uh, has its advantages, uh, lots of them that I won't really uh, try to cover here. But uh, as, as you watch me over there playing with various blend modes for this layer, we're going we're gonna to see the difference in just a moment between projection painting and 3D painting, especially as it relates to these Grobato-based UV maps. So once I've settled on what I want to do with this layer, and I think I ultimately settle on overlay here, which gives a kind of a nice stain kind of effect or look, we're going to take a look at that difference between regular 3D painting and projection painting. Do a quick render here just for fun. Alright, so let's say I wanted to use a much larger brush and, and spread some of this a uh, new stain layer, if you will, around to different parts of the model. So we'll go ahead and bump up the brush size considerably. And you'll notice as I move it around, it jumps all over the UV map on the right. And if you were to paint this way, that's what would happen with the paint. It would end up on parts of the model where you didn't intend it to go. Because it just jumps to whatever it touches. It jumps to that area of the UV map. And since it's a large brush, it may very well hit things that you didn't want to hit. And that's where projection comes in. When we switch to projection, we lose all of those nice layers we have. We're going to be painting into a single projection paint layer. But you'll notice now that I move the brush around, nothing is happening in the UV map. The paint is going to go exactly where you see it in the 3D view. So we'll set a more moderate size brush here and just start painting. And it goes and magically finds all of the right polygons in the UV map all the right areas of the bitmap and paints into them and creates a wonderfully contiguous uh, texture freeing you entirely from having to think at all about UV polygons or the bitmap. It's really a what you see is what you get. It allows you to concentrate on the 3D rendering and, and how your paint is going to play out there. So that's painting into a um, projection paint layer, which by the way is the layer that was selected when we switch to projection paint. And you can see that layer down here in the Layers tab. But when we switch back to 3D paint, turn off projection paint that is, you'll see there it is, that's the layer we were just painting into. And if we turn it on and off, you can see its contribution to the overall texture. So that was painting you know, freely into the entire model with projection paint. But sometimes you're going to want to limit where projection paint goes. And normal bitmap selections don't have any effect on projection painting. But fortunately, there's a way to, to do it. I'm going to go ahead and create a, another new layer here to paint into, projection paint into. And I'm going to create a selection and then turn that selection into a layer mask. So let's go back to the UV tools and the rectangle selection and just grab a, a couple of other patches here with a rectangle selection which will replace the old selection with this new one. And the first thing we need to do is turn that selection of UV polygons into a bitmap selection which is done with the select menu and the create mask from selection item. Um, and now we have a selection, but again, it's a bitmap selection, and it won't have any effect on projection painting. So we need to do one more thing, and that is 
create a selection, create a layer mask, I should say. We do that down here at the bottom with the Add Layer Mask button. So now we have a layer mask, and that will work with projection paint. And before we start painting, you should note that uh, because we just created a mask, we, uh, the mask is the selected part of that layer, you can see there. So we need to click over here on Layer and make sure we're painting into the layer, not into the mask. All right, with that said, we are ready to go ahead and switch to projection paint and uh, start painting away. And uh, you'll see quite clearly that the paint goes only into those areas that we have masked. So, you know, by combining all of these techniques and ones that I haven't even covered here, you can see that you have a fantastic degree of control and a great number of options for creating all kinds of sophisticated textures. Uh, and there really is a lot to be uh, had, a lot to be leveraged in the Grobato mesh structure and the UV maps. One of the things uh, I didn't show here was simply stamping, you know, if you wanted to add things like text or badges or emblems to the pair of the colonel's suit, you could do that directly into the UV map. There's very little distortion there and uh, that's usually not any kind of an issue or problem. And I also note that all of this sort of edge sensitive stuff that's easily accessed is great for things that you might do in other channels, the specular channel, displacement, bump, that sort of thing to create all kinds of interesting uh, effects. Um, nothing special about this texture map, like I say, this is just me learning and, and poking around, but right away I, I see a great potential and once I'm a little more familiar with things, I'm sure I can have uh, a lots of fun creating textures here. And I think you can as well, so look forward to seeing what you all do and thanks for watching.